X17. Yeah, it's been around for a while, I think, if it's around at all. I'd, re I'd read about it, I think, a couple of... Uh, 2016 was the first time I came across it. This work done by these nuclear physicists in Hungary, they were looking at um, beryllium, the, the, the nucleus of beryllium. It's got four protons and four neutrons in it. You can excite this nucleus. We know with atoms and electrons, right? If you excite a, the electrons in an atom, they raise up an energy level and then they, they don't want to stay there. We're all lazy, really, right? We want to go back to what we call our ground state and that's how we produce light. And so we're all familiar with the consequences of that, but in fact, you can do it with a nucleus as well. What, what they do is um, they create an excited beryllium nucleus by, they, ha they start with a lithium nucleus and then they attach a proton to it, so of a very specific energy. So here's my lithium nucleus, and in comes a proton with a very specific energy, and it then forms a beryllium nucleus, which is already at a, an excited state. So, and that excited state is compared to its natural ground state. It doesn't want to stay like this, right? It, and so what actually usually happens is it just disintegrates again. It just goes back to the proton goes out and you're left with the lithium. But every now and again, what actually happens is as it drops back down to its ground state is it emits a virtual photon. And that virtual photon just goes and uh, disappears off on you. Then every now and again, even less likely is, the, is that it emits the photon. And then the photon itself creates a pair of electron, an electron positron pair, an E plus, E minus pair. Now what usually happens is in those situations, the photon's coming out, and so the, the two particles, the electron and positron pair, they're very light particles. So when they're created, they're almost collinear with the, with the outgoing photon. So photons coming out towards you, Brady, and then the electron positron pair are created. And, and so the angle between them, this is the crucial thing, is it usually re remains small. And so as that angle increases, the, the number of electron-positron pairs that come out at larger and larger angles decreases because it, it doesn't want to do it. It wants to create, come out because of conservation of momentum, easier for it to come out straight forward. Now what these uh, people noticed was that um, at an angle of about 140 degrees, so let's see, this is zero. <laughs> uh, is that 90? <laughs> And so 140, I mean, is, is out here. They found a bump. They found an increase in the number of uh, uh, electron-positron pairs coming out. And we know from our Higgs days <laughs> that if you've got an increase uh, in a in number of events, then some, it's, it's a potential sign that something's funny going on. They, you would normally have expected this number coming out uh, as you increase the angle just to drop off monotonically. But it, it suddenly it went up. What could be causing this? One interpretation is it's, it's a particle that's being produced that then decays itself into the E plus E minus. And this is the X particle. And when they work out, given the angle that the E plus E minus pair come out at 140 degrees, you can work out what the corresponding mass of the particle must be. And it's 17 million electron volts, 17 MeV. And that's where the X17 comes from. It's the, it's the, the mass of this particle. In comes the initial proton, comes out in from outside the lithium, hits the lithium, converts it into a beryllium nucleus, which has now got four protons and four neutrons. By fine tuning the incoming uh, proton energy, you can raise the energy level of this nuclei, of the beryllium, to actually, so I think it's 18.16 <laughs> MeV, million electron volts. And that's an excited state, it, it, it's not the ground state. It then decays. As it decays, rather than creating the photon which then creates the electron-positron pair, it creates this X particle. So that's when the X17 that's happens when the X, during the, during the, the relaxation of the yeah, excited... Yeah. Right. It creates this, but it's a massive particle, so it's coming out now with, with relatively low momentum. That then means that when it... When it decays. When it, does the, it, when it does it split. It does it split to create the electron-positron pair. They can come out at a large angle. Ah. 
where, whereas a photon couldn't, because a photon's got high momentum, it's going to then want to go directly into the E plus E minus in the same direction. So because the X17 is so sluggish yeah. and has less momentum, yeah. it creates this ability to do a wider angle split. A wider split. angle split. And, it, and so that was the interpretation. And they, they wrote this up. It didn't do a lot for a, for a while. For a few months, it sort of laid there. But I remember reading a paper by um, Jonathan Feng and his collaborators at Irvine, where they were looking at this uh, experiment and trying to interpret this result in terms of some model. And so it was then that I, I remember reading it and thinking, in order to explain this result, they're having to do something, some twists and turns in the particle physics beyond what you would normally expect from the standard model of particle physics in order to get these, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, this X particle is a boson, it's got spin one. And there have been experiments looking for these particles. The NA48 experiment is one at CERN, which had been looking for virtual bosons like these and hadn't found any. And in fact, it would naively have ruled out this experiment of the beryllium from their own results. And in order to sort of make sure the two were compatible, Feng and, and collaborators realized that one way of doing it would be to effectively change some of the interactions that the protons were having with this X particle, such that it would be access, it would be allowed for the beryllium experiment to do what it was doing, but it would account for the fact that the NA48 experiment was not seeing anything. It's generated a lot of interest. I mean, I think there's like 140 papers have been written citing this original work, but it was back in 2016. I think the thing that has caused a renewed interest, the same group in Hungary produced new results, this time not using beryllium, but using a helium nucleus. They did the same sort of experiment and they found that once again, they f there was a bump when they were looking at the, the, the creation of the electron-positron pair. They found a bump, not at 140 degrees, which was the result for the beryllium, but at, uh, I think 115 degrees. And when they worked, then worked backwards and took into account the fact that this was a helium nucleus and not a beryllium nucleus, they once again found that the corresponding mass of the particle, that if you understood it as from a decay of a particle, was, I think it's 16.7 million electron volts again, comparable to what they had before. That sounds like a smoking gun. It does sound like a smoking gun. It's quite intriguing. But in the meantime, <laughs> there have been the, the initial result um, that they, they obtained in 2016 has, of course, got people thinking about this. And uh, the, the experimentalists at CERN have been, there's a, an experiment called, I think it's NA64, which published its results in 2006, 2018, so about a year ago, where they went looking for the original X particle, right? They went looking for a, for a, a, a gauge boson which had a mass of about 16.7 million electron volts. And the way they did it was they used the super protons synchrotron collider at CERN they had a, a beam of electrons of about 100 GeV, that's a giga electron volts. They collided it into a target, so it's called a beam dump. They collided it into a target because if this particle was there, what would happen is that electrons that were being stopped as it hit the target could interact with actually Z bosons, Z vector bosons in the target, and they, in principle, could produce this X particle. And then the X particle being, with its interactions, could actually leave the beam dump and it, it would then decay further down the, the, the chain and in a set of detectors, creating the E plus E minus pair. And so what they were looking for were these two sort of almost simultaneous events, not quite simultaneous, where the beam dump loses an amount of energy, but that same amount of energy is found further down the line. And the interpretation would be the electron had um, as it hit the Z boson, would have created this particle, which then moved out from the beam dump further down into the de detector and decayed. And they didn't see it. They saw no evidence of it. And so that has allowed them to rule out regions of the parameter space that the original paper was, was um, exploring. But this new result, 
which is with the helium, sort of is it, it sounds like a smoking gun. In some ways it is because it's a new nuclei. But what it's really, really crying out for is another experiment along the same lines as the beryllium one, but done by a different team. Right? So why, did we, why did people so readily accept the Higgs? Well, I think there were two major reasons. One was mathematically, it was expected to be in the ballpark where it was found. That's why they built the LHC with the energy they did on the size it did. So the mathematics of the standard model and beyond the standard model had suggested there should be something there. And then two detectors, totally separate detectors, found it effectively simultaneously. They were finding evidence for the Higgs, that's the CMS detector and Atlas, were finding it simultaneously. In this case, there's one experiment and it's found it once. It's, there's a bit of a track record where they have found events before that have, that have disappeared, found evidence for these bosons of different masses that have disappeared. They're arguing this is a, a stronger result, but they found it for beryllium and now for helium. That, that's positive, but what it's really requiring is another experiment along those lines to come along and say yes and confirm it. Have other teams tried it. Are there other teams around the world who've done similar experiments and said, we haven't found that bump at those angles? I'm not aware of other experiments doing exactly what the beryllium, the, the Hungarian guys are doing, because they're doing a proper nuclear physics experiment. And so this is this interesting interface between nuclear physics and actual particle physics. The, the, the experiments that I'm aware of that are testing this are, are particle physics experiments, colliding electrons at a high energy into a beam dump and looking for different types of detectors, looking for dark matter detectors. I mean, one of the exciting things about this result, if it was to hold, is that there are dark matter models which would have a particle of around 10, 20 million electron volts. These light particles could be there. And, and these, there are models where there are these vector bosons. When I talked about the, why, why did we believe the Higgs, I said, well, because the standard model was suggesting and, and beyond it was suggesting that it should be there, it was in the mathematics. One of the things that has had to, they've had to do in this particular case from the theoretical standpoint is you, we've had to do some quite severe twists and turns to the particle physics to make sure we can accommodate this result in terms of a particle whilst also accepting NA48 didn't find it at CERN. It's not an easy fit. It's not an easy fit. And in, in fact, you've basically had to introduce an, a new charge that, that, that accounts for why this X particle doesn't interact with the proton like it would with the electron. And in fact, it's, it, it's called protophobic. <laughs> It, it doesn't want to interact with the proton. It will happily now interact with the neutron, but not with the proton. And that's unusual. Photons normally will interact with the, with, the, with, the, with the proton. And you're forcing this to do it. And so you need to look for, for examples why this is not happening. Is there another logical explanation doing the rounds? Are, are there other physicists who are saying, oh, no, I can explain those bumps at those angles. It could just be, you know, yeah. X, Y, Z. Well, I think the... If you want it to be a so one possibility is as I said it, it, it well one possibility is that's a mistake it, and then, oh yeah, yeah. So, so we should should point that out of course right that um, the, that's another reason why you need to do this experiment with another group that, that there are maybe they've got their systematics wrong they, perhaps this bump is a I mean the, the the word you hear is this is like a seven sigma detection well seven sigma means it's one one chance in a hundred billion that it's a random event I mean that so. But if you've missed some big systematic, that, that could all go away. So I'm not aware of any sort of realistic accepted particle physics explanations as to what this is, other than people coming in with this idea of a particle or the possibility that it's, it's, it's actually not there at all. We, we've just got to go and revisit the systematics of the experiment. If we imagine the X17 particle is legit, yeah. it is real, right? Yeah. yeah. What can you tell me about it? Can you oh, give me an idea? Can you give me an idea on it's like how big that is and right. what charge it is? It, and so it's light. So an an electron, which we t we actually tend to think of as being almost massless, right, is half an MeV. 
So this is 34 times the mass of the electron. The proton is uh, roughly a thousand MeV. But the, the, you've, you've, as usual, you've come up with a key question, <laughs> which, which is that um, it's not particularly the, pro the particle that's important here. And that, why is that? The particle in, 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 in particle physics is, is symptomatic of the existence of something else. It's symptomatic of the existence of a, of a quantum field. So when we think of the photon in particle physics, the associated field is the electromagnetic field. When we think of the, um, uh, the Higgs particle that was discovered, why people were so excited was the existence of the Higgs field. And what the particles are are excitations of those fields, very strong excitations. The existence of a field means there, there's a force between, there's an interaction between particles. And so what you are finding here is if this particle really exists, there's an associated X field exists, and we have a fifth force. And the mass of this field is such that this could be a long range fifth force. And, and then you've got all sorts of interesting possibilities coming in about why we not detected it, what are, what are its subsequent properties, and what other influences could it have on, the, on forces, on nature. We're always looking for fifth forces. I mean, well, some people would say it's a sixth force. Let me, we'd say there's electromagnetism, there's the weak interactions, the strong interactions, gravity. The discovery of the Higgs is regarded as some as providing us with another interaction, which is the interaction of the Higgs field with particles. And, but this new interaction is, has not been detected before, if it's there, and it could open the, uh, you know, there are many searches on for, for examples of either these long-range interactions with regard to the dark energy driving the acceleration of the universe, with, or with regard to the presence of the particles themselves as dark matter candidates. There, there's a big push for these light dark matter candidates at the moment because we're not, we haven't seen any evidence of supersymmetry in the Large Hadron Collider, which is usually associated with the existence of WIMPs. So the WIMP dark matter candidate hasn't shown up yet. And so people are naturally beginning to sort of think, well, perhaps we should need to look further afield. Could X17 be dark matter? Well, there's one possibility. There are dark matter candidates that are in that regime in terms of their mass range. Now, I, I don't know enough about the interaction cross-section of this X17 particle with other particles. The people have looked in, are looking in this mass range with these what are called direct det detectors, di direct dark matter detectors, and they haven't seen anything, but whether or not that in its own right yet says anything about these X17 remains to be seen. X17 has no charge? Like it's not negative like an electron or positive like a proton? Um, no, I don't think so because it, it, it decays producing an E plus E minus, so overall electric charge is zero. Yeah. If you told me, Brady, go and find me an electron, I think I know where to look. That you know, If you said, Brady, find me a proton or a neutron, yeah, I know where to look. Yeah. You said, find me a photon. <laughs> They're quite easy to find. Yeah, yeah. Where are the X17s if they exist? Yeah, they're, where they're, are they living? So the, the, if the, if they're there, in the, they 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 um, it turns out that they're not in that decay of the beryllium, for example, where remember what I said, beryllium naturally just decays back to the lithium; it just breaks up again. There's then then the next level of decay is via these virtual photons, which then themselves de decay into E plus E minus. One in a million of them, roughly, would be the production of the. X particle. But that's a rare event, it's that collision. That's, event. Like a, that's a manifest. So you're going to have to work hard, right? You're going to have so that, to... So right now, there's no X-17s, if they exist, right now there's no X-17s in, the in you. Yeah. Um, I don't... That's a good question. I, I don't think I'm any... of. Well, I, I often am quite excited, and I, I do get excited, but I don't know, I think of an individual... Uh, helium... I mean, I've got helium in me. Um, I don't think of... And I must have some beryllium in me, I guess, too. I don't think it's at that excited energy state that then decays. If it does, by the way, um, it's pretty hard to find. I think their lifetime is around 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So, Ed, so it could have found them, they just disappear. So Ed, if particles are excitations of a field, yeah. including electrons and protons and things like that, yeah. how come electrons and protons are so abundant in this room and so long-lived, and yet this X17, which is heavier than an electron and lighter than a proton, 
doesn't have this ability to manifest itself and then hang around? So that's that's a oof, that's a tough question. But so the electron is the so the electromagnetic field is pervading this room, and the the electrons would be associated with well the photons would be associated with excitations of that, as would the the electrons which obey electromagnetic interactions. The the, the protons are a bit more unusual. The, the, the majority of the mass of the proton is not in the quarks. And the majority of the mass of the pr proton, I mean, if you, if you add up the mass of the quarks, each quark is, has a, a, a rest mass of about um, 3 MeV. So their total mass is about 10 MeV, and I've just said the mass of a proton is uh, 1,000 MeV. So the majority of the mass of the proton is actually in the binding energy of the, of the, of the quarks, uh, of the gluons, sorry. That are, that are propagating around it all the time. So it's not quite as straightforward as sort of turning on the quarks and saying, there's your proton. So, but so I think it's, it's but you, it is a case of the, 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 the relative excitation in the field is the thing that determines the underlying um, uh, mass of these objects. But the proton itself is, is this combination of the quarks and the gluons, which makes it a bit less clear how you're going to generate them. So the X17 field, if it exists, yeah. is one that just doesn't get excited very often in our world. I guess that's true. I mean, it seems to be the product of a decay of a, 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 a more excited uh, beryllium. But you've got me thinking, I'm not quite sure, because it's, it doesn't require a huge amount of energy. These are not massive energy scales compared to what you, what you get. But I think the, the issue is, is, it's not just that, it does depend on the interaction these the X17 particles have. What what type of interactions it has with the other f force, other matter particles. And we've seen that in order to explain its existence, we have to already do something rather unusual. We have to make that interaction one that's proton protophobic, in order, which means that it's not interacting like the usual particles are interacting. So that could have an impact on how likely it is to be formed out of some excitation of the field. Are you an X-17 sceptic or...? Uh... I still remain a little bit of an X-17 sceptic, yeah. I think um, it, it does require... Um, a, it requires more particle physics explanation for, for why it might be there in, in, a, in a coherent uh, framework. And, and B, it, above all, it needs more experimental um, evidence coming from a similar type of uh, experiment to verify whether the bump that they're seeing is actual real or not. Shoot it through the air, it's absorbed in the air. So to, to measure the X-ray absorption of our compound, which is sensitive to the air, we need to be able to remove the air and encase it. So we use beryllium to make a magic box around our sample that the X-rays can come into.